All right. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to a special follow-up episode to Psych of RPGs. In my previous video, I talked about risks and how it affects our decision making. And specifically, I connected that to the game Blades in the Dark. Uh, today, I have with me John Harper, the designer of Blades and many other fantastic games. Uh, so thank you so much, John, for being here. Really excited to have you. Would you mind just taking a moment to introduce yourself to everyone? Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm John Harper. I'm a game designer in Seattle, Washington, and I've uh, been doing it for a long time. You probably know me from Lady Blackbird or Blaze in the Dark, Lasers and Feelings. Um, Agon just, just came out, uh, second edition. Um, yeah, uh, I, I uh, was a graphic designer uh, by trade for a long time um, and have been a full-time game designer now for the last few years. We, I actually just started in, in uh, an Agon campaign or, you know, we're nice. not meeting as regularly, but we, you know, when we, when we do get together, cause it's so perfect for that episodic store style of play when, when you can pick up and play, it fits so well for it. So we've been really digging that. Yeah. You don't really need continuity necessarily. You can just do like the sort of standalone. Yeah, episode. exactly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk to you about, about Blades, and I have a question that kind of generally talks about Blades and then some of the stuff that's related to the, the risk and decision-making stuff that I was talking about in my video. So when I, when I introduce Blades to folks, I usually talk about it as this machine, this well-tuned machine that has a lot of small moving parts that once the machine kind of gets going, it really, it just sort of runs itself. Um, and so, you know, at first, maybe when you're first learning Blades, you, there's like a lot going on, but as those pieces start to like wind up with one another, it, it, it runs really well. And so I was wondering when you were designing Blades, how much of like sort of the scope of the game was in your mind in the beginning, or did it sort of expand as the design process was going? At, were you adding more cogs to this machine as you were going sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh pretty much the latter um, in terms of systems. Uh, Blades was developed over a couple of years of weekly game sessions. Um, and that group, that playtest group, we pretty much just played and iterated every week, um, almost changing the game that on a weekly basis, roughly. Um, but it came after a very long Stars Without Number campaign uh, that was over a hundred sessions. Um, and, or no, I guess that, that one wasn't that long. It was maybe 60, I guess, but, um, <clears throat> it was long and we'd been doing the sandbox play thing for, for a while, uh, and had developed some techniques of our own, our, in our sort of house game system, um, bolted onto Kevin Crawford's great sandbox system for stars without number. Um, so we'd already kind of developed some of these tools or techniques, but, uh, as we went through the process of play and design with blades, um, it became apparent that some of those were going to have to be systematized in a more kind of concrete tool way so that other groups could use them and not be us <laughs> with all of this background, uh, of, of sort of skills and methods that we had that we had come up with. So it was less like creating uh, stuff from whole cloth and more kind of recognizing things that we did as a group that helped the heisty sandbox thing go and then creating a system that would replicate that method in for, for, a, for another group that hadn't done it before. So it's tricky because if you haven't done it before and you only have the system uh, coming out of re reading a book even without seeing anyone play it, um, it can be difficult sometimes to get that going at your table. Um, but that was the transmission method we had at the time. And um, I, I think for, for the most part, groups like uh, get to it pretty quick. After a session or two, they start to like, it starts to uh, roll a little better. But um, yeah, it was it was a process of of recognizing what we were doing, trying to be very objective and like look at like weight how, how, how are we having like factional relationships? How does that work in our game? Can we put numbers on that? Can we project that out into the future for future game groups to play with and that, that sort of thing? Um, and then after the Kickstarter, um, it got play tested by bunches, a bunch of uh, outside uh, people. So that 
helped that whole process keep continue and um, things that our group had thought were already kind of set in stone. Um, I realized that they need for the refinement. So it was another year plus or so after the Kickstarter still doing that process of, of uh, systematizing what we were doing at the table. That, that experience that you describe of like, it takes like a session or two to sort of get the machine running essentially. Uh, I, I've run three campaigns in Blades and at, there was one point in time where all three were run at the same time, which was very exciting because it was different groups and so they could feel the reverberations of each other's effects across mm, the city. That's good. Yeah. Very exciting to do. But, you know, it, it was a very much, I, I always tout Blades in the Dark for its its cycle of play. And it, it very much understands the cycle of play and it's, it's systemized very well. And once they got through like a cycle of do a heist, do the downtime, see any kind of like factional shifts that might be going on, and then we're going to do it again, they that sort of like, there's a switch that goes off and they get really into it then. Um, especially when they learn some of the other factions or other players uh, that I'm working with uh, outside of their table. That, that makes it very fun too. Yeah, I ran a very long Apocalypse World um, sprawling meta campaign thing with three different game groups uh, in, that, in that vein where they were kind of the, the uh, threats uh, on each other's horizons. And that was, that was really fun. Um, and we, we ended up having a, a big sort of hangout one night and uh, all the players started talking like, that was you that was doing that? We, we didn't know where that was coming from. Uh, and then during that conversation, after it was over, they had like rearranged the groups because some of the players were like, I want to go and play in, in the thing you're doing and I want to be in this one. So they like, without telling me, they like swapped who was in which thing. <laughs> so when we played again, the, all the PCs had been shuffled around and That's it was great. great. Yeah. Very fun. That's, that's very fun. E kind of easier on the GM in a way because you you don't have to come up with that material. The other players are just doing it for you. Yeah, that was that was the thing. Once they learned that they were in the same city as one another, they started to be each other's antagonist. I didn't have to really push them or poke them in any way. They were like, "Oh, well, no. we're gonna go mess with them," uh, <laughs> and it was great. So uh, I kind of just let them take take the reins, so to speak. Yeah. So I want to talk about um, I want to talk about risk uh, in terms of the stuff that I talked about in my video, and, and one of the things that is generally kind of considered is that we we like to avoid loss. We don't like to lose things, and I I don't think that's necessarily a groundbreaking thing. But when we consider in games and in RPGs, like in Blades in particular, your your mechanic, the players know ahead of time before they've picked up the dice what the consequences of the role are going to be. That generally the stakes are sort of laid out. And I think, you know, compared to a number of other systems, that's not necessarily the experience that other systems have. A lot of other systems will usually be like, you're going to roll, and if something goes poorly, the GM's going to tell you what happens uh, poorly. But I think in Blades, from my experience, both how I play it, how I read it, even uh, watching your actual plays uh, a few years ago, the stakes are all laid out ahead of time. So the loss is, 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 um, it's not hidden. So where did that sort of design idea come from? Uh, deciding to lay out the stakes that clearly before the dice are even picked up? Uh, there's kind of two different tracks uh, there. Uh, one is by playing ga games that don't necessarily prompt you to describe the stakes um, and having those, those dud rolls uh, if no one's paying attention or you just kind of are moving along and not thinking about it and someone calls for a roll and someone rolls and fails and then everyone kind of goes uh mm, uh i don't even know what this was for like it was kind of it's the classic like perception check failure where you see the look on the gm's face when there's a perception check and they fail and the gm's like oh oh crap and now i can't tell you the thing that you need to know to do the thing and everything just comes to a stop uh and it happens with other kind of roles too, but um, in the early sort of indie design um, theory crafting spaces where I was talking to a lot of people, um, setting stakes became this sort of buzz term. Um, and a lot of those early games specifically uh, called it that. And you had sort of a stake setting phase of your resolution system or, or scene setting, or, um, you have stakes built into that. And it was kind of a blunt instrument, but it, it brought it to the forefront and made people really think about that as a part of game design. Um, 
so that had always been on my mind and sort of middle to late term um, games from that period uh, leading up to like Apocalypse World started to kind of bake it all in. So you weren't doing the sort of stake setting discussion necessarily. It was kind of just part of the system, the way the moves function, you know, those stakes are part of the outcomes that are built in there. But once we got into the way Blade started to work, sort of pulling away from moves, um, we found we needed to have that conversation again. It had to happen somewhere in the, in the process. Uh, since we didn't have these sort of baked in moves uh, structures. So it was through a lot of iteration and stuff to get there, but um, it really, it came from seeing the failures of uh, not having that kind of thing. And then having played a bunch of games that had it baked in, I felt like it really needed to be part of, uh, part of Blades. And then the other vector is the, um, <sighs> I don't, I'm not sure what to call it. It's the like uh, the Jimmy McNulty uh, factor, I guess, uh, from the wire. Like the the character that doesn't always have their own best interests um, in at heart. Like even if they think they do, they're kind of their own worst enemy. And so, if you want, when you try to play a character like that, uh, you want to know like this is bad for me when I, going into this it's probably not going to work out. I have a bad chance of success. The, the outcomes are all bad. There's no upside for me. Um, if you don't know that stuff ahead of time, it's hard to play into it and like be that type of character because most systems will kind of by default make you kind of heroic or, or successful. And if you want to play a character that's not that, <laughs> uh, it's, it's nice to have that, that cue from the game or from the GM or whatever saying like, ah, uh, this is a bad idea. This is just a bad idea. And you're like, yeah, exactly. This, this character is reckless and stupid and that's, that's what they're going to do. Um, and so we, we have several people in that, in that game group that I talked about the, that main play test group that love to play that type of character. And, and I do too. So that was always part of our like local, um, method in any game we played was to help out those those players that like to be that type of character so um for blades it's 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 in the genre too for for the, the that, those type of characters to sometimes be that way so uh the that system needed to support that by the that flagging of of risk and reward um up front that that kind of blends nicely into the sort of follow-up question i had about this which was Generally, um, like you said, a lot of games treat the, the PCs as, as heroic or like not just competent, but like experts, like very good or at least above average in whatever it is that they're doing. So you're likely to succeed. But um, on top of that, you also have sort of, as you just were describing, some players who have different play styles of like some are very risk seeking uh, sort of daredevil players and then some are more of the like controlled i want to protect my pc at all costs sort of thing yep and yep. so you know in reading blades you see that there are mechanics not beyond just knowing the outcome of role ahead of time there are mechanics in there that are sort of that feed into both of those play styles um and i was just curious as you were designing that um were there experiences at the table that sort of prompted those things like you were describing? Um, or was there almost like an anticipation of, you know, is this going to be a game that is for risk seekers? And how do we accommodate the people who aren't those risk seekers or vice versa? I'm just curious how, what that process might have been like. Yeah, there was there was a corresponding uh, risk averse player or two uh, in those groups as well. And so we were always riding that line where, you, you want to have that space in the fiction for the, those characters maybe to be in friction with each other um, where the, the careful character uh, is trying to do X and the reckless character is doing Y and they're at odds or maybe they're rivals or maybe there's fun banter or something. But often that can be a player to player friction where the player wants to be careful uh, and the other player wants to be reckless like in their real self and then then those real people are coming into conflict so again having those tools that can center it in the game uh and focus on how these characters are 
behaving a certain way, this way or that. <clears throat> and it's okay for those characters to have friction. It's fun in the story to have that kind of friction. Um, and then remove that, hopefully try to or reduce the, the friction among the real life people. So they're both, they just have the right expectations that, because um, often those that friction comes from not neither player kind of knowing what we're trying to do as a as a table um are we are we trying to just sneak around all the monsters and get the treasure out of the dungeon or are we going to fight them all or are we what are we what are we doing <laughs> and so that goes back to crew design too where um having the crew sheet and having making all those decisions funnels players in that direction too where you know up front okay we're we're cutthroat bravos that you know kick down doors and and threaten people like okay the pe person who really wants to play the careful careful person can say up front like i don't want to play that type of crew uh let's do something else you know um so all of those things touch on on that uh friction and then it drills all the way down into the ris control risky desperate uh position determination because you can have that conversation there's no rule that says uh controlled roles happen when blah. Um, it, a, a situation is controlled, risky, or desperate based on a, a, our judgment of the thing, the character, what we want out of the scene even, or like if you want to play dramatic beats uh, or whatever, the, 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 the group gets to decide that. And it can be on a player by player basis too. So that, again, that person who is kind of risk averse um, maybe can can really um flag that to the group and say like no i want to be that i want to be the cool controlled stealthy person who's in the shadows and is like not taking a bunch of risk and is this smooth operator and you're like oh yeah great okay well we can we can lean into that when we're spotlighting your character and then over here we can have all this desperate explosions and stuff with this character um even though you both have you know two dots in a rating we can just sort of treat you differently in the fiction because that's what we're trying to do uh, as a sort of creative team so that that was that was a thing that definitely came out of play because we had very reckless players in the group and very risk averse players in the group so in the in the same same uh crew yeah Having that crew as sort of the the glue that binds everybody together, sort of to give a, a focus or almost like a a vibe or style by which the, the the table will act has been really really helpful for me when when putting together blades groups because folks might have individual preferences on the type of character that they want to play or the style of game that they like to play, and so when we have those different preferences immediately you know like all right well this crew's not going to work at all but like this crew you know it feeds a little bit in this person's desires and a little per a little bit in this person's desires and it it is i found that to be sort of the magic ingredient that helps bring together what i would call maybe like disparate players who who have very different preferences or different um ways that they like to play the game the crew sheet glues it all together in a really nice way um i'm trying to I don't think I recall um, sort of what was the first crew that you had sort of designed? Uh, Cause like in the early like Kickstarter, I know there was the, the quick start and it didn't have everything inside of it, but what was sort of the first crew that was around? Like the, the idea of blades being centered around this thing. The original game was a uh, thieves guild. Um, so very specifically uh, which the, the shadows crew in the final game is, can be a, that or it can be other stuff. It can be, you know, spies or whatever. But the original was very much like classic Fofford and Grey Mouser esque kind of Thieves Guild uh, group. And it was totally focused on, well, <laughs> the idea was that it was totally focused on kind of thievery type scores. But right out of the gate, we had a player who wanted to pursue a magical direction and was really into the lore of ancient demons and unearthing secret artifacts and things. So right out of the gate, we kind of started to turn away from like purely a, a thief, uh, like video game kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was meant to be a thieves guild and 
uh, it even had kind of a a whole other layer of mini game that ended up getting stripped out that was all this sort of upkeep of your territory and you could have all these sub operations they kind of got put into the into the grid of claims um, for the, on the crew sheets but it used to be a lot more involved and all the players basically ignored that and didn't care about like running an organization it just wasn't something that they really wanted to do so it fell by the wayside but um, yeah it was very, very uh, classic fantasy thieves guild originally the the next question i have is it's it's semi related to some of the stuff we've talked about before with the the knowing the stakes ahead of time so in, in the video that i talked about there's sort of people choosing between a sure shot something that they know is a guaranteed thing although it's usually like a lesser outcome not the ideal outcome or risking it where it could either go disastrously or they can get a really good thing. And depending on how the question is asked, people are risk seeking or risk aversive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so inherent then sort of in, in my blades experience is when a, when a, when a role is getting ready, there's this bargaining going on. Right. And, and, folks can work with the GM to to make something desperate if it wasn't desperate yeah. before because they want to. And so there's there's this ability to to change those outcomes ahead of time. And so I know we've talked a little bit about the GM sort of establishing stakes ahead of time and loss ahead of time because it's very helpful for a whole host of reasons. But was the bargaining aspect of the role also sort of baked in early on or was that something that sort of emerged also as kind of I guess maybe alongside the law or the the stakes thing like where did the the bargaining element come from it, it was there from the beginning um uh, probably the mechanic that was almost the first thing uh in the game was was this sort of ladder of uh risk reward uh measurement and it took many forms over a long period of time and for a while it was like the main the only mechanic kind of like everything funneled into it and it was it didn't work but um we kept grinding and grinding at that because it it is something that that game group um had done for a long time uh and, and the devil's bargain mechanic also kind of getting a bonus die in exchange for uh for kind of a guaranteed um bit of trouble uh it, it's something that we had done in in everything we played. Um, th there's there's a, a, a method that was called out uh, to me a, a while back. Um, so someone pointed out this GMing style of mine where I I tend to say things like, uh, "What you know? You kick down the door. There's an ogre in the room who whirls around and says, "Ah, man, meat picks you up uh, and t t you know tears you limb from limb." Uh, and, and just I just go and I just like say stuff, and the player's like, whoa, 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 whoa hang on, hang on, whoa, and I had wait. So when he whirls around, I want to do this. Um, and there's this kind of like rewinding, or you could call it bargaining in a way. There's part of it is showing the the potential future consequences of facing this dangerous monster, uh, and part of it is kind of making assumptions and and setting up my initial. Uh, position in the bargaining to say um, if you're rushing in here this is kind of what's going on and they said no no I didn't say I was rushing in anywhere uh, oh you're not okay what what are you doing then and that that organic process is kind of what you get in blades when the player says uh, you know I want to like uh, swat his pistol out of his hand and deck him and jump out jump out the window uh, and the GM says Oh really? Uh, geez, um, this guy's like no pushover. That's that's definitely desperate. And the player goes, "What? Really? Oh, I didn't realize that was like that. I thought he was just some guy. Uh, what would be risky then? Uh, <laughs> you know." And so you you do that again. It's like kind of rewinding in a way before we settle on the final thing. And um, sometimes you get to those places where uh, if the GM is kind of following their their GM instructions to to portray the fiction. Um, there are cases sometimes where you're like, there is no control position here. Like this thing you're doing just is completely unsafe. It's completely reckless. 
there's no there's no safe form of it so you cannot you cannot do it and do something else but we can't dial it all the way back there and sometimes it's the same thing with desperate um it's often uh the desperate thing is no no problem because people want the xp but um so sometimes it's it can't be desperate like sometimes you really are in this position and i know you want that xp but uh this person's your friend and they kind of they'll go along with you you know you're not do you want to ruin the relationship <laughs> then we can get desperate right. and and you can start to push it that way um but yeah it is that that whole thing um definitely came out of play it was it was a our sort of local style was to always be in that bargaining mode for all the games we played. My my last sort of big question that I had was you actually sort of just answered it there, which was, um, you know, how we ask our questions to people is going to affect the way that they think about them and, and answer them. And so I was going to ask if you've sort of shaped a style by which you ask questions while you play games, but then you you just reminded me that from yes from what the streams that i have watched you gm that's absolutely your style of just like i'm gonna keep going until you stop me sort of thing uh, <laughs> yeah yeah and, then, I, and i and i do like to ask questions like leading questions is like the great sgm tool i think um uh, uh, not just me i think it's common knowledge that that's that's just a great 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 way to, to run games um but there's something to be said for uh sometimes going too far saying too much um it to fill that void uh sometimes you have that like all the energy leaves the the table all of a sudden and people are kind of looking at each other like oh, i don't know do you want to do something uh, maybe we should like have a meeting <laughs> it's something i always try to avoid when i play role-playing games is it, it can turn into a meeting like really easily where the players stop playing the game and like have a meeting about the game. Uh, and I, I don't want that at my table. I think most people don't want that, but they'll fall into it given the opportunity. So just kind of going forward and saying, yeah, you, he picks you up and throws you out the window and then he turns to the wizard and breaks him in half <laughs> and everyone's like, ah, what? No, no, no. Then there's, they're scrambling. There, there's something to do instead of, uh, you come into the room, there's an ogre, what do you do? It's a little bit flat. Uh, but but also the, the leading question thing is is always really fun. Um, and having those positions to work with can help, I think, if you're just starting out, especially um, if someone ha has their opening offer of what they're going to do as a character, you can say, well, don't, but don't you want to disarm him before you jump out the window so he can't shoot at you as you run away? I mean, you could try to do it. It'd be desperate, but it seemed it seems like a good idea if you want to try that. Like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, 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 I'll do that. Um, so yeah, I think it's a combination of of both of um, dangling those leading questions out there, and, and with devil's bargains also. Um, um, it, it it's a, 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 in the blade system. It's a way of putting a name to those techniques. Um, Again, so they're transferable uh, in book form to other people. Great. Well, I, I just have a couple of more rapid fire questions, not, not to brain burners or anything like that. What was your favorite crew and class to design for, for Blades? Mm. Ooh. Uh, I guess for crew, probably the cult. Um, it's just fun to write stuff like that, uh, that the, the cult crew and then also the sort of advanced um, culty stuff in the in the supernatural chapter of, you know, uh, com communing with forgotten beings and having weird powers and stuff. That's always fun. Um, but all the crews were fun. The um, smugglers uh, was fun, too. I like I like having the kind of um vehicle centric games i've always enjoyed that we have our our little floating home or whatever um so that was fun to write for that uh and for playbooks um it's it's a, it'd be a toss-up the, the whisper just because it went through a lot of different versions um it started out 
it was always called the whisper but it wasn't like completely ghost centric at the beginning because the setting was a little different when we first started um so refining that to this kind of ghost summoner uh type was was really fun yeah probably the whisper is there a particular like special ability from a, a crew or a, a a playbook that jumps out to you as like a, one that you just absolutely loved writing or you you hit it and you're like that was it i i'm really happy with that one uh yeah the um for the lurk uh i think we call it the devil's footsteps um it's a little like parkour uh t tony jaw fighting style <laughs> move um and one of the options is that you like get your opponents to attack each other um by you know flipping out of the way at the last second or whatever and uh that's always fun uh any kind of acrobatic shenanigans like that i i enjoy and then this this last one that i have here is about the districts in in Duskfall. uh what was your what was maybe your favorite district to either write or maybe your favorite district to set some of your own games or sessions in uh at crowsfoot definitely uh was the the catalyst uh, for the game. And um, that starting situation was there pretty much from the beginning, the the two gangs going to war again after a long truce and um, having the, the former uh, peacemaker boss dead. Uh, and once we got into the ghost heavy part of the setting that made that much more interesting because he was sort of around if you wanted him to be around. Um, and yeah, just that, that little pressure cooker of um it's it's almost it's almost a microcosm of the rest of the game the the crow's foot thing uh where those you, you can play that little situation of just three factions um and the and the players um without you don't necessarily need to bring in the other underworld stuff or even the blue coats and stuff if you don't want to um and once you kind of get that under your belt or try it out for a couple sessions or whatever you can start to expand out and ultimately the whole city kind of runs that way they're all these factions that there's kind of a bit of a power vacuum and they're all trying to do their thing so yeah i think crow's foot was uh re refining that down so it worked that way and it was a little tutorial but also a plausible situation and all that that was that was really fun to do, to dig into or just refine over time because it, it 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 was one of there were three starting options one and the very first like handout for blades and that was one of them was the that situation yeah. i found that in all three of my campaigns inevitably the players were drawn to the night market they always just wanted mm -hmm. to, they and it was great you know because then of course they would all inevitably run into each other there too but um that for some reason that was the one that really uh struck a chord with them that they, they they fell in love with and uh i think it's is it the second blades novel i think it's the second one um andrew shields uh has uh silk shore as kind of like a major it might be the first one actually um uh it's a major location in the story and he the way he describes silk shore i'm always like oh yeah i should set a game in silk shore this is really cool <laughs> we never really focused on it in any of my games but yeah, I love Andrew's description of it. Well, that's that's everything that I've got for today. So thank you so much, John, for taking the time to, to chat with me. I really appreciate it. Um, where yeah, can folks, my pleasure. Where can folks find you online? Or are there any projects that you're working on or things that you'd like to, to plug right now? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter, uh, John underscore Harper. Uh, and johnharper.itch.io is where my games are. Uh, yeah, I'm working on a few things. Um, Agon has a kind of uh, supplemental um, system concept that we're calling Paragon system. Uh, so people can make little hacks and things for it. And I've put out a couple myself uh, and I'm working on three more right now. Um, plus other stuff. Uh, there's always a bunch of things going on the back burners. Um, but this year there'll be a lot of stuff coming around stuff for blades also uh so that's very exciting i can't get into it 
in too much detail, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, mostly Paragon stuff right now and then and Blade stuff later this year. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you again. And thanks to everyone for, for watching this video. I'll make sure that all the links of, for everything that we talked about are down in the description below so you can find that. Uh, thank you again, John, and have a great day, everyone.